welcome. Today is the world celebrates Halloween. That actually comes from the, the, the old English for All Hallowed's Evening, where Halloween is the hallowed evening where we get ready to celebrate All Saints Day tomorrow. Um, throughout the world, there's all kinds of different customs attached to it, and some of them, some of them are associated with not only remembering the dead, those who have died, and that's part of where Halloween comes from, but then also those who are, all those who are part of the body of Christ, and, and that's where All Saints Day fits in. We'll celebrate that within our church calendar as a movable festival and move it on to the next Sunday following our Reformation Day celebrations all the time. But as we recognize that, and we'll hear more about that in the readings over the weekend, coming next weekend, we build still on this very real sense that we heard yesterday in our gospel reading from John, that, that if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And through baptism, Christ indeed does that. We are baptized into Christ, clothed with him and his forgiveness and everything that is attached to his life, his death, his resurrection, so that all of that becomes ours and we're tucked away in Jesus so that we participate in that. So often we forget, though, to make build on that. And that's part of the part where baptism and Holy Communion fit together is these two gifts of Christ, where he says that forgiveness of sins continues to be fed and nourished into our lives so that we, we abstract it and turn it into something that's just an idea. Jesus never does that. He preaches it, and then he says, I'm going to give it to you. Now swim in it, live in it, eat and drink it. This is yours. Come, receive, participate, so that we can participate in the fullness of that life which begins, continues, and ends with those, those beautiful words of forgiveness and life. Romans today, Paul tries to unfold that in the way in which, you know, people, well, people in every generation, including our own, continue to stumble over that. And that's why so many um, within the world and society, they say, I like Jesus, but I'm, I'm a good person, so I should be able to make it in. Well, no, Jesus never says that's how it works, because, you know, you know, with man, it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. When he's talking to the young young lawyer who comes up to him in Luke's gospel and said, and he asks, so what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus so he plays along with it, and he goes through the Ten Commandments. He says, well, I've done all of those sorts of things. And then he says, well, okay, now... Come and follow me, sell everything you have. That was just a step too much. And he wanders away and the disciples say, well, who then can be saved? And Jesus' words point out with us, with our own works, it's impossible. With our own efforts, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And indeed, that's what he does and prepares through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul builds on that throughout the book of Romans. And during a time where Christians wrestled with understanding exactly what that means, because on the one hand, you had people say, well, there's grace and. So grace and all these works that you've got to do. And Paul makes it very clear, salvation comes as a gift, plain and simple. And sure, as the Holy Spirit works in our lives, there's works that grow out of that as the fruits of faith. But the fruit of faith shows that the faith is there, not the other way around. As we take a look at the other side, though, Paul also wrestled with the group that said, well, if God loves to forgive and I love to sin, it doesn't matter what I do. And all of that gets pushed aside. And Paul, again, a couple of chapters later, he points out that no, um, you know, let that not be the way that we, megonoito is, is the, the Greek underneath. <laughs> Absolutely not, he says. That's, that's not how it works either, because baptized into Christ, we become participants in the life, death, and resurrection of, of our Savior, so that our whole life then becomes tied into this working of the Holy Spirit where he draws us to die to our sins, repentance, putting off of the old Adam, the old sinful self, always to be renewed in the resurrection. And that becomes, you know, the circular pattern of our Christian lives where we recognize that we carry within ourselves, the way Paul writes in Romans, this body of death, Okay, this brokenness where we keep messing up. Okay, and but at the same time, rather than beating ourselves up about this, who will rescue me from this body of death? Christ Jesus, my Lord, my Savior. And we always go back and build on that in the way in which Jesus comes to feed us in that word and sacrament, word and sacrament, word and sacrament. Romans three nineteen to twenty eight beautifully captures the way in which Paul lays the foundation for all of this. We're starting with verse 19. And actually, let's begin first with a word of prayer. I've been talking lots, haven't I? 
Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for that gift of your Son. Send us your Holy Spirit so that as we wrestle with these words of Scripture that you would give us a clear understanding so that rather than superimposing our own misunderstandings or our own confusion or our own ideas over top of what what you've taught us through this Apostle Paul and other places throughout the New Testament and Old Testament, that we would continue to be able to build with that clear gift and understanding that your, your love and your life, which is given to us as a pure gift through Paul, grant us not only a lively awareness of that gift so that day by day we would be able to wear that, that baptismal gown, but call us and draw us always together so that built together into that new family of your church, that we would grow up in that salvation as well. All this we pray for in his name. Amen. All right. You can tell I get excited about this because this is the message that we so desperately need within our world where we so easily confuse what I do with what Jesus does so that we talk about Jesus, Savior, Savior, Savior. Yes, but I'm a good person. And then we think that our goodness which is really only a comparative goodness. I'm better than that person over there. That's what we really mean when we say I'm a good person. We don't actually deal with the brokenness that lives within our own lives. And, and it's, it's learning to wrestle with that and recognize that that's always what trips us up, that we need a savior. Here, as Paul points this out, and he explains this in Romans 3, the whole book of Romans is really an explanation of this. But Romans 3, verse 19, he starts, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. That's a mouthful, but when you listen to it, all he's saying is, is that the works of the law can't get us there, because through the works of the law, you know, we might be able to get close to doing what, what you know, God says, or we might make it look like that, but underneath there's still this whole problem. Through the works, through the law itself, basically, the best that we can have as we stand before God is, and it's true, you know, standing in front of other people, we can do good things. We can help them. We can follow God's law, even though we don't ever do it perfectly. But for our neighbor, that becomes a very important thing. But before God, that brokenness that we carry is still plainly visible to his sight. And here's the problem. If we want to stand before God through the works of the law, no one of us is perfect. And so through the works of the law, as we stand before him, all we can do is recognize that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, is what Paul writes. That's where he says, you know, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God because by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. We, if you break the law in one point, and this is the way James puts it, you've broken it all. And this is where Paul is pointing to and he says, this is our problem. This is our problem. And so if you think you can climb up and clamor into heaven through the works of the law, we still fall short. There's no way that we can say that we're good enough, even though in our worldly way of thinking, and this filters into many denominations in which the way, the way in which they preach, I'm good enough. Or, you know, the couch surfing Christians who prefer not to go to church because they figure they don't need that. That's only where the hypocrites go. I'm good enough, I don't need to go. Well, of course hypocrites go to church. Every one of us is a hypocrite, especially when we try to pretend that we're good. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Through the works of the law, you know, we can't claim that we're good enough to get into heaven. In fact, the way that Paul puts it very clearly, in the same way that Jesus did when he met with that with that, that young lawyer who just added on with the works of the law. And he says, okay, if you think you can do it. And then the disciples said, well, who can be saved? And Jesus says, you're right. With us, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Salvation comes as a gift from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And this becomes the stumbling block for so many, possibly even for you as you're listening because we always want to interject ourselves. Through the works of the law, you know, sure, we can demonstrate God's love to people around us, and we should be doing that, okay? I'm not saying ever that we shouldn't, 
We should be doing that. The trouble is, is standing before God, all of that is just dirty rags because it's never perfect. Never perfect. Okay. And then we fall into this whole problem that we heard last week with the Pharisee and the tax collector where the Pharisee stands in the temple and says, I thank you, not, not like all these other people. And it's not to pick on the Jewish community, but in order to show, use that as a mirror for ourselves, it's basically to point out, because that's the way in which the, you know, part of the religious culture of the day was framed and formed, is that as long as you stay away from the stuff that we consider to be bad, then, then, then thank you, Lord, I'm not like that person. I thank you that I'm not like that tax collector over there. Um, the fact of the matter is, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the poor tax collector who couldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, was the one who went, who went home justified because he turned to the one who judged justify. Back to God, repentance, return to the Lord. It's not his prayer per se that gets him in, but it's the giving of that grace from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 21, but now... And here Paul is drawing a contrast. And this is exactly the point of, you know, proper Lutheran theology, confessional Lutheran theology, not, not liberal Lutheranism, which goes and chases after whatever the latest, the latest um, and greatest of cultural philosophies is in order to make ourselves stand, look like we're just with the program. Unfortunately, those exist in the world. And also not like the old pietistic ones where, you know, you take a look and, but, but it has to have, it has to be just like this. And so we insert all these laws. Proper Lutheran theology always builds on this, this fine edge and distinction between what the law is and what the gospel is. The law serves both as a guide as well as a, um, a curb for our actions. That's true. Okay, because underneath we still struggle with sin. So a guide to show us what we ought to do, but then also a curb to rein in um, inappropriate actions. It has to be God's law, not human traditions and all these sorts of things, which every society loves to add on. But then the middle one is what Paul is writing about, that mirror function, where the mirror of the law simply shows us our sin. Okay, and the way I sometimes describe it is, is like you wake up in the morning and before you go out, you look in the mirror to make sure your hair is all right and all those sorts of things. You know, so for me, I have a cowlick that shows up every so often to check your teeth to make sure you don't have broccoli in it and those kinds of things along the way. Um, and, and as we listen to this, you know, it, it, that's what the law does. It shows us that we're out of place. Okay. Um, Unfortunately, within our world, and this is part of our sinful self, the way we react is, is when we discover, um, when, when the law convicts us, when the Holy Spirit convicts us through the law, we get upset at him, and we try to reject it, and we do the fight, flight, freeze thing, and we run away. We want to do it our own way. But compare that to the morning when you look in the mirror. If you discover you have broccoli in your teeth, do you get mad at the mirror? Does that make sense? Of course not. We take a look and we say, oh, goodness, i got to clean that out. We pull out our toothbrush or the floss and then we clean everything up. Um, it's not that we do the cleaning, though, in a theological sense. It's the Lord that does the cleaning. And so Paul highlights on the one hand with these first couple of verses, the law is a mirror. And then he goes on, verse 21, but now, and this is something different, he says, this is what the law does. And in our spiritual sense, in our spiritual lives, the law can never save us because it always accuses. Verse 21, the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God has been manifested, revealed from, uh, apart from the law. So it's something different, totally different, he says. He's not saying that it's through the law. He says it's apart from the law. So there's the law and then there's the gospel. And yes, through the law, we ought to serve our neighbors, absolutely. And Luther says the same thing, and this is some, the same thing which we as Lutherans teach. We serve our neighbors using God's law as a way to guide us and direct us. But at the same time, you know, our righteousness comes from God apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So in other words, the law and the prophets, referring to the Old Testament, the, you know, the teachings of Moses and the Pentateuch, and then the prophets throughout history and throughout time, they point to this new righteousness that will come, that new covenant, the way Jeremiah puts it, um, that, that will be rooted in forgiveness. All of these sorts of things as we hear them along the way throughout the prophetic writings, 
They point to this new righteousness that comes to us apart from the law, from God. Okay, so what does that mean? The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. The word faith fundamentally in the Greek language means to trust. I know a lot of people like to try and add in faithfulness. Sometimes that sense of faithfulness comes in when it talks about the faithfulness of Christ. Okay, and then they try to say, now it depends on my faithfulness. No, it's, we're saved by grace through, which, with the righteousness that comes from God. So what Paul just said, that is not tied to the works of the law, but instead it comes through faith in who? comes through faith in whom, I should say, in Jesus Christ for all who believe and put their trust in him. This becomes a stumbling block for many, gen many denominations because they would like to say it's faith and works or it's your decision and faith that makes it rather than faith as a gift that comes through the word, through the waters of baptism, where we receive forgiveness of sins and the Holy Spirit. And then we swim within that as we put on our baptism time and time again. That's putting on Christ. And then as we come to receive that heartbeat of our Savior from the cross, as he gives it to us in the Holy Supper of our Lord, all of these places where he says, for the forgiveness of your sins. We try to substitute other things in there, even, even though they're not mentioned. No, as we listen to this, comes through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God is credited to us. And this is the way in which Paul builds that whole book of the Romans. So that, as he points out, even Abraham wasn't saved by the works of the law because the law had not yet been given, not even by circumcision, in order to address those during the time of the early church who insisted, in order to be a Christian, you've got to be circumcised first, become Jewish, and then along the way, <coughs> doing all of these things, you can be part of the church. And Paul says, no, because even Abraham, before circumcision was in, you know, even implemented, even before then, Abraham was credited to him as righteousness because he believed. It was through faith. And he's pointing out it's the same for us, and for every nation, every language, every tribe, and in every generation. So the righteousness of God, the righteousness from God, which comes to us, it's through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. And here's that Jewish-Gentile debate. We need to hear it in our own day and age for what it is as well. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, he says. There's no difference. Okay. within our own churches, doesn't matter if you've been there for since forever and a day, right since the founding, or whether you are someone that is brand new in the church, whether you are the tiniest of infants who has just been baptized into Christ, or whether you've been around for 20, 30, 40 years within that life of this particular congregation. It doesn't matter what the ethnicity of the congregation is, and I'm talking to people around the world, so that even the founding generation may have all been, you know, monoculture largely from one, you know, one community, and then it's mixed over the years. It's not that the newer cultures in there all of a sudden have second-class rights. Within the church, all have sinned, and our history, our background, our ethnicity has no bearing whatsoever on whether we've got more forgiveness or less forgiveness because all have sinned, but we receive that righteousness from God through faith in Jesus Christ, same Savior, Palestinian, Israelite Savior. He's not a white man, okay? For those who like to grumble and complain about, you know, whiteness within our modern generation as though Christianity is all a white kind of a production. And I just saw an article about that circulating under a news feed. Oh, goodness. Let's put that to rest and let's put that aside. Christianity is spread through all nations with the same scriptures and the same gospel. And we need to get back to that rather than always trying to find offense based on you know, this or that and other characteristic worldly ways that we divide things up. So all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the law. That's what the law as the mirror does for us. 
But then also, here's what that gift of the gospel does. And, and, doesn't say but, and are justified by his grace as a gift. Not? A gift is not something that you earn, something that's given. They're justified by grace, the graciousness of God as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So where is the redemption? In Christ Jesus. And I know in our modern day and age where we turn faith into an idea, we so often miss over, gloss over this so that we say, yeah, 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 that's wonderful. Now I can do whatever. I can stay at home on my couch. No, that's not what he's saying. Because in Christ Jesus, as we're going to discover two chapters later, how do you get to be in Christ Jesus? It's through baptism. Because we are baptized into Christ. So that this is a baptismal term. Jesus extends that gift into our lives through baptism, through the word and through Holy Communion. And it's not a matter of, you know, a smorgasbord where we'll say, I'll take one, but forget the other ones. Um, he invites us into this full meal deal, okay? So that as we wrestle and struggle with our faith and our brokenness, which we all continue to carry, that he continues to call us through the Holy Spirit, through the word back to immerse ourselves in that gift that comes from God through faith in Christ Jesus, by faith, by believing. So here, as we continue, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and, so, are justified by his grace. And that and is important because the and points to the reality that God wants all people to be saved. He's not saying all have sinned, but some are justified. He wants everybody to be justified through faith, by grace, in Christ Jesus as that gift of redemption. And that's where that taking apart each word along the way becomes important. In Christ Jesus, how do you get to be in Christ Jesus? Through baptism, so that being made members of the body of Christ, okay, and that's Paul in 1 Corinthians, we become partakers of everything that he's done for us. We become clothed in that. We receive the Holy Spirit and become temples of God and temples of the Holy Spirit through baptism. And then we get to participate and partake of the death and resurrection of Christ. Okay, where, as Paul says, in Holy Communion, where we receive the body and blood of Christ in, with, and under the bread and wine. So we're justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Okay, is Paul trying to make it confusing here? Absolutely not. Okay, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. So as we listen to all of this, who did, and, and in that big word propitiation, <coughs> let's unpackage that. Propitiation, what is it? We kind of scratch our heads and say, I don't know, it's a Bible word. But within the context, particularly within a Greek, Greek circle, and because he's writing to both a Jewish and a Greek kind of a context within the early church, He's writing this in order to point out propitiation was a kind of an offering that was done mainly by Greek and Romans, where it was this idea that you have this altar, little altar, and then you pour out some sort of an oil or a wine offering or drink offering on top of this altar for the gods and for the deities along the way in order to atone for some kind of a sin. With all of that background, okay, what is it about Jesus that makes him the linchpin? And basically, he's pointing to the death and resurrection of Jesus. But he's pointing out, saying that all of this happens, we're justified by grace through faith in what Jesus has done by being in Christ through baptism, Romans chapter 6, and because of how Jesus poured himself out by his very own blood, okay, to be received by faith. And there's a little bit of an echo there also tied to the Lord's Supper. And all of this is to show how God, his righteousness, unfolds in the world where his sense of justice is not um, restitution, the way that we so often like to say and see in the world, where we go after someone in order to make them grovel, and sort of kind of vengeance on our part. But instead, God's sense of justice is he takes the brokenness of the world onto himself in Christ Jesus, 
and then dies for us, pours out his blood so that we can be declared righteous by faith, not through the works of the law, because we simply can't. We can't in any way that allows us to clamor into heaven. But instead, God comes down to us in order to give us that gift. In his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins, and that points to God's patience with us. Where, you know, God overlooks our sins until the coming of Christ, and then he gives us that gift in Christ. And even now, as we wait for our Lord to return, <coughs> there's a certain sense of patience. But don't build on the patience as though that's an excuse to avoid receiving and growing in that gift of God that comes to us in and through the word and the sacraments where Jesus does present himself to us and draw us into himself. All of this, this talk about justification then, yes, God makes us right, but he makes us right to draw us into that, that, um, that, that communion, that, that, that fellowship with God through Jesus where and as we look at it, that's specifically the way in which God has said that he's going to open that gift up to us. Um, so that we can't simply say, I'll do it on my own and I can have my own fellowship with God out of the lake or whatever. Just don't bother me about church stuff. Church is where Christ is celebrated and church is the body of Christ where, you know, built in baptism and in the word and, and gathered around that meal that we, we celebrate where Christ is, is himself the food for our life and salvation. And so as we hear this, this is what is given. This is what the heartbeat of the church is and must be about from God, even though we stumble. I know we stumble and this is why we always need to return to that. So that, yes, as I mentioned before, there's hypocrites in church, you betcha. Everyone's a hypocrite, whether you're in church or not. And along the way, our salvation is not based on our own self and how better we can make ourselves look than the next person, but on the gift of salvation that comes to us from Christ, that faith. So it was to show his righteousness at the present time, now, so that he, God, might be just, okay? He's the just one and the justifier, the one that makes us right with God, of the one who, what, does enough good works? No, but of the one who has faith in Jesus. Paul has here drawn this radical distinction then between the works of the law and salvation that comes by faith. And that faith is not just an idea, the way that we so often say, faith is a set of ideas as long as you hold on to them. <clears throat> faith is trusting that Jesus has done this and then coming to receive that in the places where he said he's going to give it. Baptism, the fellowship of the church and the word, and then at the altar of our Lord. It's a matter of using these gifts. So that, just like if you go and... And, and uh, you know, go to the doctor and the doctor says, I know what's wrong with you. Say, great, hallelujah. And then here's the medicine. Great. Okay, go send it off and then we don't pick up the medicine. Doesn't do us any good. Or if we pick it up and then put it on the shelf and don't use it. Let's be people that use the, these gifts the way Jesus said, come, come and I'll give you rest. Verse 27 then. <clears throat> Paul here is building on the boasting that was taking place in the church, particularly between the Judaic and the, the Gentile Christians, where the Judaic one says, well, we have all of the history. We are descendants of Abraham. You know, our men have been circumcised and all of these sorts of things. We followed all of these customs and all of these sorts of ways in which we can trip up. And these are words that we need to wrestle with within the church. But in the same way that you've got people that will say, well, I've done all the things that Jesus said that we should do. Have you really? Um, but, you know, even though we don't listen and we don't hear the invitation to come and receive and be part and don't give up meeting together and all of these sorts of things. And why? Because this is where Jesus gives. Gives. And we say, well, no, no, no. If he, can, if he gives, he'll give it to me on my terms. Does that ever work when it comes to medicine? The doctor will heal me on my terms. Okay. It's like, no. And yet, that's where a lot of people go today. No, he says, what becomes of our boasting? 
when we compare ourselves and say everyone else is a hypocrite? Well, he says, it's excluded. By what kind of a law? By a law of works. So in other words, can you ever say that I'm better than the next person or I'm good enough to make it into heaven and I deserve it? He says, no, but by the law of faith. Okay. Which means trusting in Jesus, following him, receiving the gifts where he says he's going to give it, using those gifts, participating in the body of Christ, because that's where the Holy Spirit draws us back to. For we hold that person, that one is justified, made right with God, in other words, by faith, and he says, apart from works of the law. No one of us is ever good enough, even as a Christian. And we're called to enter into heaven, not by our own merits, because none of them are ever good enough, not by our own, our own works, because they're never complete, but instead by the gift, where he says, where we're justified by his grace, God's graciousness, through faith, all through what Jesus has done, and the way in which he gives it to us. And we find that, and that's where we use the word sacraments and how we use the word sacraments within, you know, a proper Lutheran church, pointing to the places specifically where Jesus says that that connection comes. Peter preaching on Pentecost, repent, believe, and be baptized. Every one of you, when they said, what should we do? He doesn't say, pray the sinner's prayer with me. He doesn't say, do lots of good works. But he says, repent, return to the Lord, believe and be baptized, believe in Jesus, be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the Holy Spirit. And the gift is for you and for your children. The way in which Jesus says, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no life in you. Um, and when the Pharisees grumbled and complained, how can this man give us his flesh and blood to eat? He actually makes it stronger in the Greek so that he moves from a polite word to eating to a word of ravenous eating where we come and we chow down on the flesh and blood of Jesus, which in the big context of scripture is, well, you know, you look at the way in which Jesus has said in all of the other gospels and Paul repeats again, it's in the celebration of the Lord's Supper. This is my body. This is my blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Where we become participants in the death and resurrection of Jesus, the way Paul says. These things, as a result, are part of that faith. Where faith lays hold of and uses these blessings and these gifts where Jesus gives the gifts so that we build on what Christ has done not based on our own works, but on the works and the gift of Jesus, which he lavishly gives to us so that we're not guessing about where to find him. But instead, he says, here I am, hidden under these things for you. Come, taste, receive, partake, and be part of that eternal gift even today. Amen. <laughs>